Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Tom, and I am an alcoholic, and I'm uh, glad to be here. Thank you very much for the invitation. I I live in Oakland. I've been in the Bay Area a long time. Um, I've had the good fortune to visit your part of the universe, too, on more than one occasion, and it is always a pleasure to come up, um, not just for your air and food, but uh, the some of my sober friends up here. I've been drunk up here, too, a couple of times. Um, I was attending a, a big party at Seattle University, and you know how things just get out of the way. And that's what happened, and I apologize if you were there. Um, but I'm glad to be here and share a bit of experience, strength, and hope. And there might be new people and visitors. Um, AA is such a funny dance. You know... In, in a lot of organizations for something like this, they would invite people with a lot of wisdom and panache to share. Um, and we have found that's not really very helpful for us because we compare. And when you hear the speaker say they have no bad days and everything is wonderful and their kids are talking to them, you say, oh, poor me, uh, I am not that good. So instead, we usually have lunatics share at the public level. (laughs) And then you can say, I thought I was having a pretty bad day, and then I heard the speaker, and I feel much better about myself. So um, uh, keep that in mind as as you hear me, and also know, uh, I mean, we tell our stories. That's the gift we give each other. I try not to lecture or preach or harangue. Uh, at meetings when I'm in my right mind. Um, if there's something I say that you disagree with, that's really fine. You don't have to leave. I don't have to leave. And also, you don't have to tell me about it. Um, <laughs> you can, you can just let me go home, which I, which I hope to do and, 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 uh, rejoice with your own mental health. Um, <laughs> I'm um, I'm a Californian. My dad was born in San Francisco in 1904 for the earthquake, and, and I'm uh, from San Jose, and I was born in 1947, um, which makes me 68, in case to save you the math. But I'm telling people I'm almost 70 because it's just easier to say, and I can say that for five years, so I'm just almost 70. And I got sober when I was 29 years old, um, and even saying that is wrong, you know, because what it implies, I got so, when did you get sober, Tom? Well, I got sober. Um, the implication is that I realized some things were out of balance, and so I took steps, you know, and now I'm fine, how are you? Well, <laughs> I was talking with Joe a little bit before the meeting, and Joe's a hopeless alcoholic of the worst kind, so I relaxed right away. <laughs> and, uh, you know, when do you get sober? I, I don't ask for help. I'm not one of those guys. Um, I don't ask for help, and I don't ask for directions. And I think growing up, um, the message I got was, if you have a problem, you are a problem. So don't have problems. You know, how are you? Just fine, thanks, becomes a very important part of my story. Um, and I was drowning in alcohol, and it never occurred to me to ask for help. It never... Uh, when I'm in trouble, my first instinct is to be sneaky about it. And, and that's followed by don't tell anyone, and then hunker down, you know. I mean, just just tough this one out. So I have a lot of that. I was somewhere looking for glue in a store yesterday, not to sniff, but to repair something. (laughs) And I was somewhere in the Bay Area, and I went up to one of the personnel there working, and I said, where do you keep your glue? 
and uh, I was pointed in a direction, and I, I had to give more information, you know. I said, you know, usually I wouldn't ask. Usually I would search your store for two hours looking for the glue and then shamefully asking, but I'm running late today and I don't have time for my search, so I just thought I'd ask. And uh, I said, this is a moment of recovery. And <laughs> this poor young man almost called security, figuring we, we have one of them in the store again and we want to watch him. He didn't find me amusing at all. I thought I was hilarious. Oh, well. That's happened before. I think I'm hilarious and no one else is laughing. So <sighs> I'm a, I'm a, I am a Catholic priest. I'm a, I'm a member of the Jesuit community. Um, and um, if you Google Jesuit, there's a lot of anti-Catholic, anti-Jesuit stuff that says we murder babies and are cannibals and Satanists. And uh, that's just not true. <laughs> I mean, just... <laughs> Read the other blogs uh, that are friendly. And it's a community within the Catholic Church, and we're largely teachers. Uh, we do retreat work. We do all kinds of things. Seattle University is one of our schools, and Seattle Prep, and um, we have play Georgetown is another one, Fordham. Who cares? Um, I'm a member of that community, and um, in the late 60s, early 70s, all of the leadership uh, for dioceses and bishops and provincials and religious orders, all of the leadership in the Catholic Church got an actual education on alcoholism. People went around, there were some sober people, National Clergy Council on Alcoholism, National Council on Alcoholism, thank you Marty Mann, and a few others, and they would talk to these excellencies in chief who were in charge of stuff, and the message they gave them was, there's a lot of alcoholics. It's a disease. It is a curable disease. It is a treatable disease. If some of your people surface as alcoholics, get them some help. So it was the kind of breakthrough, the illiteracy around alcoholism and the fuzzy thinking. And that was late 70s, late 60s, early 70s. And, uh, I'm, I'm a very loud, enthusiastic alcoholic. So, uh, part of, of the deal was to watch and wait for the right time. And um, a cla two classmates of mine saw me drowning. They hadn't seen me in a few years, and we had a new boss, and uh, I was his first alcoholic. And I got put into treatment uh, in Berkeley. I was studying theology at the Graduate Theological Union. Um, I was studying theology. I just finished my second year. And I was put into treatment and came out of treatment on a Friday and started my third year of studies on a Monday. Um, and I want to talk about that for just a little bit of time. The timing was right. I don't know how many people here have been intervened on. It's a terrible experience. I just want you to know that. Uh, they outmaneuver you and they outgun you and, and they're not fair. They don't play fair. Um, I have been in charge of a couple of interventions myself over the years, and you do not want to give the alcoholic a break. You just attack, charge. And um, my pal, one of my pals, who we're still friends, he's, he's a priest in Sacramento, uh, his dad was a teamster. And his dad's best friend was the teamster who was in charge of all the alcoholic teamsters, if you could imagine such a job. <laughs> and my friend asked for some suggestions, and, and anyway, people cooperated, and, and I got put in the treatment. Now, when I was intervened on, it was awkward, <laughs> clumsy, off balance, embarrassing. I felt ashamed and I felt humiliated. And after I was sober for a couple of months, I got mad. And it took me, I think, five years to thank the people that saved my life. Just so you know that. Um, and I'm, I'm a fast one in recovery. Um, <laughs> it's very risky. You can lose friendships and you can, you can have all kinds of dangerous things come in. But I went into a treatment place that was A, 
a friendly and they brought a meeting in every week and we were taken out to meetings and and I liked meetings I still like meetings uh, most of the time uh, I still go to meetings most of the time my sponsor who is a hopeless alcoholic of the worst kind and a priest in Los Angeles says uh, if you like everybody you meet in AA it's a good sign you haven't been to a lot of meetings because some of us are a little difficult, you know. And one of the nice things about drinking a lot is you pass out every so often. And you're easier to live with in those kinds of circumstances. But when you're just sober 24 hours a day, it can make for some long days if if you don't have some kind of recovery coming into the picture. Anyway, I, I went to meetings and um, I liked them. And um, I... I knew nothing about alcoholism when I got here. I, I was told this by a Southern California guy. If you're speaking at an AA meeting, you should mention that you drank. And I'd like to do that for a few moments. I'd like to talk about the drinking just so you can uh, get me in your sights. Um, my sponsor was a periodic. I'm not. I'm a daily drinker. I, there were a couple of times I didn't drink, but it wasn't anything serious. Um, <laughs> mostly, mostly I'm a daily drinker, and I, I loved everything about alcohol. It really was my best friend. It was a lot more reliable and trustworthy than you could ever be. And I, um, when I was a kid, there was alcohol around the house, and I remember um, very, very small getting on a chair, reaching for the bottle of cream de menthe, which is very green and sugary. And I took a mouthful of that a couple of times. And it's just magic. It just explodes in your head. But it's green. So there's evidence. And I was not a stupid child. So I didn't do that a lot. Um, I moved instead to bourbon. My dad was a bourbon drinker. And I remember taking a mouthful of bourbon, just magic, you know. My sponsor says, you discover America with a mouthful of bourbon. <laughs> and um, and then I'd go to the refrigerator and take a can of Hershey syrup and get a mouthful of Hershey syrup and put that back. And I'll tell you, that's pretty sophisticated drinking when you're 8, 9, and 10 years old. <laughs> and I like that. I don't remember ever getting drunk uh, around those things, but I would play with alcohol and experiment with alcohol. Um, I think I had a, uh, a blackout. I had one accident. Uh, I'm in the eighth grade, one, dry, one traffic accident. I went home and I had a couple of drinks for lunch and then went back to school. I don't remember leaving the house and I don't remember getting on my bike and I don't remember the telephone pole. But I smacked into one, and uh, um, the cops found me and uh, you know knocked out on the street ambulance, and they called my mom, and they said, Mrs. Weston, we have your son. And her first thought was that my oldest brother robbed a bank. That was her first thought. But no, Tommy was passed out on the street. So there were all these questions. Um, you know, is there something wrong with the bicycle? Was the street wet? Did the telephone pole move? No one asked, give him a blood test. Because when General Eisenhower was president, it never occurred to anybody that 12-year-olds could be drunk on their bikes. Um, so I could have gone into treatment then, but I held out to 29. Um, I go into high school, and I'm a, I, I'm a drinker. Whenever I can, I'm drinking. Also, I would like to let you know I'm a drunk driver. Uh, I got my driver's license at 16, and within a short amount of time, I'm drinking and driving. Also, I do not have to be drinking to drive dangerously at 16, 17, and 18. There were a couple of very, very close calls that had nothing to do with alcohol, but it had to do with my being crazy and daring and wanting the risk. Um, my sponsor said this about drunk driving. He said, my name's Terry. I'm an alcoholic. I'm a drunk driver. Pause. That means I was willing to kill you. And that was true. 
I don't know, um, one or two or three times a week from the age of 16 to 29. For me, I never killed anybody. I never hurt anybody. But that's for next time. Um, Because I've heard those stories. You know, the person who was sober a long time and had a drink and went driving and they end up killing people. I think that could be my story. And whenever there's a article in the paper about a bunch of folks, it's 3 a.m. and a bunch of kids are in the car and there was an accident and they're all dead. I read that very carefully. Um, knowing that probably they weren't quite sober when they were driving. I'm very aware of sober driving. I took the AARP senior driving course a couple of years ago. And one of the things they told us was, uh, you know, drunk driving is very dangerous. Sleepy driving is very dangerous. It is as dangerous as drunk driving. And angry driving is very dangerous. If I'm really angry or really sleepy, I shouldn't be driving. So I, th- those are things I have found helpful to learn. Um, so I was sober for a while. And I met a physician named Dr. Gill. Dr. Gill, long, long sobriety. Dr. Gill got sober when General Eisenhower was president and he had a relapse under Mr. Kennedy and then got sober with Lyndon Johnson, which is just startling to me. I used to get drunk whenever Lyndon Johnson spoke. I would be drunk within minutes. And um, one of the benefits of having a president is you can blame presidents for everything. And I've, I found that very useful over the years. Um, or governors or bishops, I mean, whoever's there, you know. Anyway, Gil um, spent the rest of his life of medical practice helping people get well. And Gil treated a lot of people. Uh, He worked in a couple of different hospitals. But he also would teach doctors and nurses about alcoholism. And a couple of, it's a tough crowd. And and a couple of times I got to be his driver. And I would just go and hear him whenever he spoke. He was a, an eloquent man. And, um, oh, he was talking about the disease. I like Dr. Silkworth's description, allergy of the body, obsession of the mind. I, I got that and I like that. And it sure works for me. And when I heard at an early, early meeting someone say allergy and obsession, I, I, that, that wasn't news. That was just the the good description of what I had. So Gil talked and asked her questions and a lady raised her hand and said, doctor, is this really a disease? And yes, he, he'd been talking about that for an hour. Um, (laughs) you know, symptoms, progression, dead. Yeah, it's a disease. Um, And she said, well, if someone's showing early signs of alcoholism, can't you just sit them down and say, listen, (laughs) you're showing early signs of alcoholism. (laughs) You knock it off, right? I can't tell you how many people think that's a reasonable approach. Only in AA do we laugh at that when in churches people take notes. They go, oh, it's very important. (laughs) So Gil, who was a, Gil was a wise man and he was educated and kind, but a truth teller. And you know, is it really a disease, doctor? Uh, Can't you just get them to say no? And Gil paused for a moment and he said, the problem with that is it doesn't work. And the reason it doesn't work is because alcoholism is a disease that has three distinct phases to it. Phase one is the fun phase. This is when it's fun. And as I shared with you a little bit uh, a few minutes ago, I had a great time drinking when I was a kid. Uh, it, it perked me up. It made me feel funny. It made me feel uh, mature. It made me feel suave. I relax. I had a pretty good time drinking when I was a kid. <laughs> and that's called the fun phase. Phase two. Fun plus problems. <laughs> it's still fun. But you start to have problems, you know, uh, unexpected vomitings and urinations and... <laughs> hangovers and showing up 
for examinations hung over either as a student or a teacher, happens on both sides. Um, blackouts, uh, saying impossible things to people, being a jerk, drunk driving, you start to have uh, problems, but it's still fun. Stage three, alcoholism. Problems. The good times are gone. Never again could we recapture the great moments of the past. Now, my understanding is the first step asks this question. Are you still having any fun? And if you're still having fun with your drinking, we don't look good to you. <laughs> um, we're old and stupid and wear the wrong clothes and oh no, I can't go there. I have too much self-respect. <laughs> to find us interesting, you need to have the gift of desperation. And if you're desperate enough, you're glad to be in the lifeboat. No matter who else is there. This is also very true in Al-Anon terms. I also go to Al-Anon. Uh, I started Al-Anon when I was six or seven or eight years sober uh, because I did not want to be a sober person who was shooting people. <laughs> anyway, I mentioned that at a meeting and this lady came up to me and she said, I'm seven years sober and I hate everyone. Should I go to Al-Anon? And I said, hold out as long as you can. <laughs> Don't get there too fast because you're going to walk in the room and say, oh my God, they're knitting. I can't possibly come back. <laughs> People are holding stuffed animals. I'm sorry. I have too much self-respect. I can't go to meetings like that. But if you're really desperate, you'll love them, you know? So step one, it's a tough step. Um, I don't know of anybody who's taken step one feeling pretty good about things. <laughs> Job's good, family's good, a lot of self-respect, I think I'll join AA. That's not <laughs> how it works. You know, so step one. That, so anyway, I, I, uh, I loved Gil and I would, I would listen to Gil. It, so he died in his early nineties and, he got the macular degeneration and, and very deaf in both ears, one ear a little better. And so he needed drivers and I would drive him around. And we just wanted to get Gil to talk because he knew a lot. He was very, very well. Met Bill Wilson, you know, did all these things. Um, I got him to come to my home group meeting, which is Tuesday nights in Oakland. And it used to be a bunch of old people. And then something happened, and the room is full of young people. I don't know how that happened. And they're all tattooed and wearing black, but they're all young. And um, I wanted them to hear Gil. Gil was still very sharp, but we knew that one day Gil wasn't going to wake up, so we brought him to the meeting. I drove him over from Marin County, which is very far away. And um, Gil came and... and uh, stood in front of this group of 20, 30 young persons, and he said, uh, I hope I'm facing the right way. I cannot see you. <laughs> I hope I am not shouting. I cannot hear. And then he said, my name is Gil, and I'm a recovering gynecologist. Mm -hmm. And then what this man did, this man who was sober before some of these people's parents were born, um, Gil shared from the heart about experience, strength, and hope. It was a wonderful experience. Again, the great gift of going to meetings um, and, and learning stuff from meetings. So, good old Dr. Gill. Um, step one was not a big problem for me. Um, I'm a little depressed anyway. Half Irish, half Swedish. Neither group is known for optimism. Um, 
So when you tell me that I'm doomed, I, I've, I've known that all along. Um, <laughs> the sun is burning out. The polar bears are drowning. It's, it, yes. Um, with a couple of years of recovery and a little therapy, now I, I see myself as a pessimist with a good attitude. But I, <laughs> I'm still not a, a, a wildly optimistic person. Uh, step one was not my problem. My toughest problem has been step two. Bill, in the 12 and 12, writes about step two, and he writes about faith and belief, faith and belief, faith and belief, faith and belief. And I've never liked that chapter. Uh, it's not my experience. I had faith, I had belief, and I was still drunk. Believe in God the Father Almighty. Listen, I can do that in Latin, Greek, and English, and I'm still drunk. So my problem wasn't a faith thing. It was a hope thing. I just was pretty sure the program would not work for me. I mean, I've tried. I've tried all kinds of things. And hope isn't one of those things that occurs to me. I am unique, special, and different. And the program will work for you because you are simple people. <laughs> you know? But I'm very complicated, and I'm badly wired, and uh, far more cynical than you would ever imagine being, and I just didn't think the program would work for me. And I went to meetings, and I went to meetings, and I went to meetings. I don't know if I made 90 meetings in 90 days, but I went to a lot of meetings. And in four or seven or eight months, going to meetings in Berkeley most of the time, Oakland, El Cerrito. Every so often, a couple of us would go all the way across the bridge. Meeting in San Francisco, bad people, bad program, we hate them, came back to Oakland. <laughs> I remember we left one meeting saying, and they call themselves sober over there. Ha! You know, it was uh, uh, a lot of, of local uh, narrowness and prejudice on our parts. Um, here's, here's the rule. Wherever you get sober is where they do it right. And if you go anywhere, even across the bridge, it can be a crisis. In the East Bay, meetings started at 8.30 and were over at 10. No coffee break. That's how God likes it. <laughs> and knowing that, we I remember going to one meeting at St. Patrick's Church in San Francisco that started at 8 o'clock. Can you imagine? We got there halfway through the meeting and we hated them when we thought they were stupid and went back just so upset. <laughs> Let's never do that again. Um, so uh, the moral of that story was brand new sober, I'm full of prejudice and rigidity and fear and, and those all might be the same thing. I'm not sure of that, but, but all, and very anxious about so much. But I was going to meetings. And one day, eight or nine or ten months sober, I noticed that I was not the only person in the room. <laughs> That's a very big deal if you have always been the only person in the room. I mean the only real person, you know. And then a little bit later, it occurred to me that everybody in the room, anybody in the room had a chance. And I was in the room. I, I didn't get swept into mental and spiritual health for a long time, but uh, flickers of growth. I was 20 years clean and sober and I went to a monastery, very dramatic, in New Mexico, very dramatic. And I thought I'd spend a few days 
in some reflection and some quiet and reread the book and a few other things. I was there with a couple other priest friends of mine who were sober, and we had a few conversations. And at 20 years clean and sober, I thought I should have deep insights by now and profound things to say. Uh, and so I was wondering, okay, in 20 years, what have I, what have you learned in 20 years, Tom? And here's what occurred to me at 20 years. Step one is about no hope, we're doomed, there's no way out. You know. Step one, um, General Custer, more are coming. That's step one. Uh, step one, Noah, it's still raining. Step one, you know, it's, 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 it's bleak. When I got sober in 1976, um, I would hear people say they were two steppers. We do one in 12. One in twelve. Forget the rest. Step one, we're doomed. Step twelve, join us. <laughs> Why don't newcomers come back to this meeting? I can't understand it. Um, so anyway, um, how? So how do? How did I get from step one, no hope, to step two, hope? That was that was my question at twenty years. And, and here's the answer. I did not think my way from step one to step two, which is my preferred method. Let me think about this. I did not walk from step one to step two. I did not crawl from step one to step two. I sure didn't run. I got carried. I got carried by the power of a force greater than me that I met in the rooms. And they found me very isolated and very unique and very different. And over a period of weeks and months, and months, I started finding out that I had a lot in common with you. I went from no hope to a little bit of hope. I, I, I don't need a lot. Of, I just need a little bit of hope. I don't need too much. Too much hope and I think I'd be giddy. Um, I need about 18% hope. You know, 18 to 35 is just very comfortable for me. Below 18, I don't go to meetings. Um, uh, over 35, I think I should be president of AA. So, but 18 to, to 35 works just fine. And my understanding, uh, if I do the footwork of the program, I have a daily reprieve from the worst of my crazy. From the worst of my crazy. I don't get fixed. I don't get saved. I don't get repaired. I know there are places where, you know, we argue, are you recovered? <laughs> or recovering? <laughs> now, if you're on the wrong phase of the moon, you could have fist fights in the parking lot over that one. <laughs> and I think the answer is yes. <laughs> yes. A lot has been recovered, but boy, there's more work to do. I get a daily reprieve from the worst of my crazy. Whew. I, I called a friend today. My, my first meeting in Oakland, uh, I called central office, someone answered the phone. Um, I asked if there was a meeting anywhere in the Bay Area <laughs> on Friday. This is Wednesday. My first, my, the day I was intervened on was a Wednesday. It was the day that Gerald Ford was nominated for President of the United States. Uh, I have this little mental quirk where I remember things by presidents. I, I mean, I, it's, it could be worse, you know, uh, but th that's how it... Anyway, um, there was a Friday night meeting at Central Office in Oakland, and I, I drove down, I got in a car, and I drove down Friday afternoon, checked it out, saw where it was, looked around, drove back, and waited and waited and waited and waited. And I had a couple of days. I hadn't had a drink since Tuesday night. I had a couple of days, 8 o'clock meeting, or I think. And then I went down, got there, and I sat there. And, and it was an old-timers meeting. I was 29, and... Uh, Looked like I'd been living in Berkeley for two years. Pretty much dressed just like I am now. Um, and uh, long hair, of course. And uh, my beard was red at the time. <sighs> I 
happy people. Happy, chirpy, laughing, glad people. Now, if you've been drinking for a couple of years by yourself, that's very jarring to, to experience. <laughs> and the guy who ran the meeting, I think his name was Tom, and he had a little tiny white Tom Dewey mustache. Um, uh, my mother used to go around saying, I think Governor Dewey would have made a wonderful president. Um, young people, you can Google that and get the joke later. I, I don't... Um, so he shared and someone else shared and someone else shared and it was my turn to share. And I think the topic was, how was your week? I think that was the topic. And I had an awful week. And I told this group of really old people, 15, 18 people, I said, uh, I'm quick. I said, my name is Tom. I'm an alcoholic. And they said, hi, Tom, which is, again, very aggressive if you're a, a sensitive person who's been alone a lot for the last few months. And then how was my week? I said, uh, this is Friday night. I said, I haven't had a drink since Tuesday night. I did not tell them it was beer. I did not tell them it was pizza parlor beer. I mean, how humiliating. My last drink was Tuesday night. And when I told this group of really old people that I hadn't had a drink since Tuesday night, they burst into applause. And I have never been more shocked in my life. Because <laughs> that's not the response you get out there on the planet, you know. <laughs> I haven't had a drink in a month. They don't clap. Um, they they change the subject or they ask the children to leave the room, you know, I mean. <laughs> but they clapped. I've, I've seen this happen other times and it, it's such a surprise. And what occurred to me, and now I have a brain that's been soaked in booze for a long time. What occurred to me with three days or two and a half days sober, these people know what it means to not have a drink since Tuesday night. And it's a great big deal. And if I can be candid with you, anybody can get 39 years. Jerks make 20 years all the time. <laughs> Self-obsessed whiny people get 5 and 10. I mean, but how on earth do you get through that first weekend? You know, how do you get six days? How do you get 11 days? How? How? Because that's the miracle. You know? So I was thrilled. I mean, I really was. I heard those applause. And um, the guy next to me shared. Now, the guy next to me was named Gary. I called him today. He lives up here in the area. I haven't seen him in 30 years. Gary was a Vietnam vet, special forces. Couple of anger issues. <laughs> and had just gotten out of prison. About 10 days. Younger than me, but a moose. A great, big, special forces kind of guy, you know. And Gary said the first, because I had no idea what you people do. I, I don't know anything about alcoholism. I don't know anything about recovery. I know nothing. And Gary said to me, we here at Alcoholics Anonymous go to lots of meetings. I didn't know that. I didn't know what you did. I, now, I, I was in school. I was in graduate school, so you have to go to class, you know, but you can show up and then submerge again pretty easily. And I figured, well, a couple of meetings a month, I could do that. Yeah, I could do that. We go to lots of meetings. Then he said, and we don't drink in between meetings. I was flabbergasted. <laughs> really? Uh, 
Well, if I went to a meeting a day, this might be easier. That, that occurred to me. And then he said, and we don't use no dope. Now that was mentioned at my first meeting. And I was very grateful for that because I had been smoking non-habit forming marijuana every day for, oh, <laughs> you know, seven to ten years. It kind of blurs. Especially when I wasn't drinking alcohol, you need something. In fact, Mr. Ford and I got stoned together Wednesday night um, during the convention. And then Thursday night, I remember getting stoned. And now I'm at my first AA meeting. I haven't had a drink in a couple of days. But I'm planning on smoking dope later on that night. And at my first meeting, I'm told we don't do that. And I was so ready and desperate and exhausted that I just believed you. <laughs> and I didn't know... Those were the rules. Uh, and I didn't know that you could leave if you didn't like the rules. <laughs> I mean, there you are. You do what they say. And that became my program for a long time. I didn't drink, I didn't use, and I went to a lot of meetings. Now, get a book, get a sponsor. There's a lot of other stuff to do. But some stuff takes time. And when I come into recovery, I am a very sedated person. And it took a long time to start thawing out and waking up. I love that phrase, the waking up. I, I went into treatment uh, a few days later and we did group a lot in treatment. I don't know if you do group in Washington very much. Um, and I hadn't had a drink in two weeks, ten days. We're in group. And suddenly my arms and my legs began tingling like I had slept on them funny. And um, uh, the blood was starting to flow. And it was, it was very uncomfortable and very sudden. And I stood up and I said, my arms and legs are coming off. And, um, and the nurse there in group said, that's called sensation. <laughs> and it's really good when it comes back. But it scared me to death. It scared me to death. Now, some of the nurses who worked in the unit also worked next door in the burn unit. They, they kind of went back and forth. And burns are pretty bad and burns are very dangerous and you can die from burns. Uh, from shock and infection. But a real bad burn doesn't hurt because the nerves are gone. The skin's gone. And so you have to get them stabilized and, you know, sheets and stuff and moisture and air. And when you start to heal, when your skin goes back, when your nerves start growing, you know that's happening because of pain. And you felt fine two days ago, almost dead, but fine. And now... Um, everything hurts and you say everything hurts and the nurse will say this pain means you're getting well this pain means you're reviving this pain means you're coming to and they would tell us that in treatment and and this is not news I like to hear um, so I go to meetings and I go to meetings and I do a lot of things and I just I, I thought I was going crazy My behavior had become more and more erratic, more and more unpredictable. One of the symptoms of uh, alcoholism is blackouts. I've had lots of those. But another is what we call Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Your personality changes where you can be a very friendly person, have a couple of drinks and become a monster. Thus, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. It's a short story written by Robert Louis Stevenson, and there's a, at least one monograph that reports um, that Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde was the way that Robert Louis Stevenson wrote about his own experiments with cocaine, which is kind of interesting, not the point. Um, it's a short story, and there's no happy ending. Uh, Mr. Hyde wins. Dr. Jekyll disappears. Well, I had that. I had that, that 
that that personality change. I would get mean, and and sometimes I thought I was being hilarious, but it was that sarcastic ridicule attack, which I'm still very capable of. So um, I thought I was losing my mind. And now I'm sober for a while. I'm not having blackouts. Uh, I talked to a guy at the El Cerrito Fellowship and I said, how do you know if you're an alcoholic? And he said, well, I know I'm an alcoholic because I cannot guarantee my behavior after uh, I've been drinking. And I said, what does that mean? He said, that means at times I would drink a lot and nothing would happen. Other times I would drink just a little and anything could happen. And I never knew which one it was going to be. And I think at the end of my drinking, um, nine times I would drink and there wouldn't be anything really awful happening. But time number ten, oh, watch out. The drunk driving, the verbal abuse, nastiness. So, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Uh, now I'm sober and I'm feeling crazy. Uh, I'm waking up. And, and I'm waking up emotionally and I'm not waking up polite. And I think the colors of the emotions I was feeling were red and black. Very extreme, very fast, mood changes all the time. And I, no one was talking about this at meetings. People were talking about how wonderful their sponsor was. And how, every golden step and how glad they were for meetings. And I was going crazy. So I finally was at a meeting. I'm a year or two or three sober, and I hear someone say, it's been really difficult, I've been on the roller coaster. Someone used that phrase, I've been on the roller coaster, up and down and around and fast, and and that gave me a visual of what I had been feeling emotionally. I thought I was losing my mind because I was having emotions. And it was very helpful because I knew there were two of us. And the reason I mention that is sometimes it's really nice just to mention you're having a very bad day, especially if you've got some time you'll be surprised how many younger people relax. Oh, then it's okay. (laughs) Well, I was thinking of jumping off the bridge. We all think of jumping off the bridge. Let's do it tomorrow. How about a meeting today? (laughs) Really? Really? Yes, yes. Happy to see you. Come. (laughs) Tomorrow we'll go together to the bridge. Okay, we can do that. (laughs) Solidarity, you know. So I moved back to Los Angeles when I was a year sober and I went back to teach. And I want to talk about that just ever so briefly because it was so long ago, but it was a very hard year. It was my profession, uh, but I had never done it sober before and I wasn't very good at it. And I didn't know what I was feeling. And then I found out what I was feeling and it was fear. When I'm drinking and using, I didn't know how terrified I was of my students. And second year of sobriety, I was just raw with emotion. And I went to a zillion meetings in Los Angeles. And I I, um, I wrote the archbishop and I said, I'm coming down. And are there any sober priests? And uh, Cardinal Manning wrote me back and said, when you get to town, call uh, uh, Father Terry Ritchie, uh, Terry R., and uh, who is still my sponsor after 38 years. Uh, but I got to town on a Friday and I went to a meeting Friday night, two Saturday, two Sunday, called him Monday and said, I need a sponsor. And he said, when did you come to town? I said, Friday. He said, have you been to a meeting? I said, five. And he said, I'd be happy to sponsor you. He likes sponsoring desperate men. And he picked me up that night and took me to a meeting in downtown L.A. And um, I still don't have a lot of words and I don't trust anybody. I'm a year sober. I don't trust anybody and I don't know anything and everything hurts. But I stay busy and I go to meetings and I watch him. And L.A., I don't know if you've been to meetings in Southern California, but they're big. And they do have coffee breaks, which I disapprove of. And (laughs) they clap and they're very happy, well-lit rooms, and greeters at the door. See, I don't want to meet you. 
I don't want to be your best friend. I want to sit in the back. Uh, I'm going to leave a little early. Um, so there I am, and I'm very uncomfortable because that we didn't do it this way where I got sober. And after uh, two or three or four months, I finally asked my sponsor, are there any small meetings in Southern California? I thought a smaller meeting would be better for me because I wasn't making friends. I'm just too aware of myself. Can't make friends. <laughs> I said, are there any small meetings in Southern California? And he said, try a big book study. They are always small. <laughs> so... In 1977, there were a thousand meetings a week in Los Angeles County. And I'm in central LA, Loyola High School. Right now it's Koreatown. If you go down there, that's where I lived. And I, I like meetings in southern Hollywood, northern Watts. They were a lot like meetings in the East Bay. But I went to this big book study meeting and there were 12 to 18 regulars. I had just turned 30. The other people in the room were in their 40s, 50s, and 60s. And over the next two years, some of them became my first friends. It just took a long time. So I, I just want to let you know that um, things can take a long time. I was at a meeting somewhere and they said, first year is about emotional, uh, first year is physical recovery, second year is about emotional stuff, and third year is about spiritual stuff. I was very impressed. And now I think that person had four years. <laughs> and it can take a long time to deal with physical stuff. I mean, I think it took me 10 to 12 years to make practical, don't get too hungry, too angry, too lonely, too tired. About 10 or 12 years for that one. Because I kept thinking, well, I understand it so I don't have to do it. Have you ever done that? <laughs> well, I understand that. I don't have to do it. And then emotional stuff. I mean, my goodness, when, when AIDS hit the community in the late 80s, mid to late 80s, you know, addicts and alcoholics, uh, you saw someone on Monday and Friday they were dead. It was terrifying. And, and I had to start going through all kinds of things about grief and loss and mourning, and fear, and all sorts. It just opened up emotionally a huge territory for me that I did not want to go into. And uh, lots of funerals, and lots of grieving, and lots of people who were sick, and learning how to care for sick people, bringing meetings into the AIDS ward. One of the, at San Francisco Kaiser Hospital, the, the, the there was one I'm pro-nurse, by the way, in that controversial thing. I'm, uh, you know, between doctors and nurses, I vote nurse. Um, but this one nurse, uh, sober a long time from New York, and when the nurses wanted someone to negotiate with management, she's the one they elected, because she was fearless. And a sober alcoholic, of course, and she organized the AIDS ward at uh, Kaiser Hospital. And she was, uh, they just opened it up. The next week she took the nurses out on strike. <laughs> I don't know why. Uh, but management caved and, and, um, anyway, Peggy, the ward was full and she noticed over half the group was Catholic. So she called the Archbishop and she said, Archbishop, this is Peggy Farrow. A lot of your people are here. You should come down and say hello. And he was there the next day, you know. So she was, uh, she was a, a great force of good. But Peggy helped me a lot. Um, and she got stuck with a needle and got sick herself. She was the nurse who made that change where needles are now different because of Peggy. And uh, I got to be with Peggy as a good friend in sickness and in health. And it is a privilege. And if I were not a sober person... I would have been too frightened to ask how to do that. We, we share each other's lives in recovery. And it is a great gift. Um, so, we ask God for help. I regularly do. I, 
I was talking to my sponsor on one of his good days. You know, sponsors have good days and bad days. And, <laughs> and when they're having a good day, you really want to take advantage of that. <laughs> I remembered um, I was tired of teaching and what else should I do? And I ran a couple of possibilities by him and we talked a little and and I said, should I do A or should I do B? And he said, you could do either one. It can only be a terrible mistake. <laughs> You've made lots of mistakes to get here. You'll continue to make lots of mistakes once you're here. Uh, you might want to try the new job. And if it is just a nightmare, promptly admit it. Do something else and clean up your mess. And uh, you know, this is how life works. Instead of alone in my room hoping to have the perfect plan infused into my head, you know. <laughs> and he'll say we learn through trial and error, trial and error, trial and error. I taught English as a secondary language in Southeast Asia for 12 summers. And one of my language pals over there said as he's talking to adults, young adults who are learning English, and they're so afraid of making a mistake and pronouncing something wrong or getting grammar, English grammar wrong, he would say, hurry up and make your first 10,000 mistakes. And when you're done with those, that second bunch of 10,000 mistakes is coming right in. And I just think that's, again, that's such good news. I get to make mistakes all the time. There's even a whole step dedicated to it, you know? <laughs> And I think my first 10 years sober, I was wrong maybe four or five times. <laughs> and now I find it happens a lot more. So my sponsor was having a good day, and I said to him, uh, can we talk about defects of character? Because... We pray to have those removed. And I still have mine. You know, what's going on here? Should I try harder or more? I was at a meeting in Southern California and I mentioned that I, I, I get angry um, enough. Uh, I tell people I get angry because I'm surrounded by fools. But that's another conversation. Um but I do get angry, and sometimes it's just it's just uh, very unpleasant. Um, and I, I mentioned that at a meeting, and someone said to me, if you were really spiritual, you'd never get angry. <laughs> and I said, that's very helpful. So, um, again, 20 years sober, I'm looking at a few things, I'm evaluating a few things, and I, I'm reading the book. I'm in the Monastery of Christ in the Desert out in Abiquiu, New Mexico. It's so far away from everything. And I'm reading the stories in the back of the book. And I like the stories in the back of the book. In fact, I like that the volume of experience, strength, and hope of the stories from volumes 1, 2, and 3, or editions 1, 2, and 3. I was reading that last week, and, and I, I, I love reading the stories. I like making the connection. I read the, par the, philosopher, the professor's paradox, or the paradox of the professor for the first time. It made me laugh out loud. Um, so I'm reading the short story called He Sold Himself Short. One of the first people from Chicago who gets sober, and as you know, Chicago alcoholics are very bad alcoholics. We all know this. And he goes to Akron, and he hooks up with Dr. Bob, and this in the text is on page 262, fourth edition. The day before I was due to go back to Chicago, it was Dr. Bob's afternoon off, he had me to the office. He had me to the office. Oh, that's not English. <laughs> had me down to the office, had me over to the office. 
Add me to the office. And we spent three or four hours formally going through the six-step program as it was at that time. So this is 1938, 37, 39. The six steps were, number one, complete deflation. you got to crash and burn. Two, dependence and guidance from a higher power. Three, moral inventory. Four, confession. Five, restitution. Six, continued work with other alcoholics. Now, Bill will take those and turn them into 12. And some people will accuse him of ruining the program when he did that, you, because we are like that, you know. little change, bad. <laughs> Dr. Bob led me through all of these steps. At the moral inventory, he brought up several of my bad personality traits. So it's this guy's inventory, but Dr. Bob's doing the talking. Have you wanted to do that with some of your sponsees, you know? <laughs> Say, listen, before you mention anything, I'd like to cover a couple of points that I've noticed. <laughs> he brought up several of my bad personality traits or character defects, such as selfishness, conceit, jealousy, carelessness, intolerance, ill-temper, sarcasm, and resentments. Now, when I did my fourth step, I did the one that Bill recommends of resentments, fear, sexual stuff, finances. That's the way I did it. And that's, that's the way many of us have done it. But Dr. Bob is a different person. And Akron is not New York. So it's kind of a shock to realize that even in 1938, there was more than one way to do this. You know, oh, no! Um... So 20 years sober, here's what I noticed, the defects of character that I still have. I still have good doses of selfishness, conceit, jealousy, carelessness, intolerance, ill temper, sarcasm, and resentments. So sponsor who knows everything. What's going on here? And he said to me, we ask to have our defects of character removed we do not ask to have them erased. And you can move something. And it can move right back. You know? And I've done that. When, I, when I'm in, when I do the footwork, when I get to some meetings and there's time for prayer and meditation and I ask God for help and I do the things I need to be doing to stay focused and centered, I don't have a lot of trouble with these. But if I cut corners, if I try to do too much in too short a period of time, when I act like an alcoholic, my selfishness, my conceit, my jealousy, my carelessness, my intolerance, my ill temper, my sarcasm, and my resentments hook up in groups of two and three and ambush me and anyone else in the room. And then I have to admit it and then clean up the messes which happens a lot, which happens a lot. I'm glad I have a program that's useful for someone like me, and I can be a very edgy person. <sighs> Almost done. Um, my sponsor was having a good day, and I said to him, so what's God's will? You know? What's God's will? I was at a meeting and someone came up to me and I, I was not interested in talking to anybody else. I was very fascinated by myself at the time. <laughs> and this guy came in and, and he was a little pushy and, oh man, oh come on, what's God's will? What's God's will? What's God's will? And I said, okay, don't lie, don't kill. Don't steal. Don't commit adultery. How's that? And he said, oh, that's so negative. Said, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, you're right. But it's not a bad place to start, you know. Anyway, um, we didn't become friends. <laughs> so I asked my sponsor, what is God's will? And he said, it is God's will for each of us to have 
a life. Go get one. <laughs> Which means making a lot of decisions and a lot of trial and error and you see what works and we get to do this you know, in groups of folks. I like that a lot. I like the serenity prayer a lot. And this is my, my last point. It's, I heard this and I want to share it with you. Um, this fellow in Texas was talking about uh, making decisions and um, serenity point. Uh, the serenity prayer is not God give me serenity, period. I thought it was for 10 years, but that's not it. I have to make some decisions. I do not want to make decisions when I'm really high. Reflect on decisions you've made when you were really high. They're not good ones. I don't want to make decisions when I'm really low. It's a bad, it's a bad deal. I want to be in a middle place. Grant me some serenity. Because there's stuff I cannot change and there's stuff I can change. So this guy from Texas, Lake Dallas, Texas, Jesuit Retreat House said, here are three things I cannot change. I cannot change the past. And I cannot change the truth. And I cannot change you. Well, that frees up the whole day. You know? I mean, it really does. I can't tell you the effort I put into changing my parents when they were still alive because they would have been so much happier if only they followed half a dozen of my immediate suggestions. What can I change? I can change my thinking. I can change my behavior. And I can change my attitudes. And that's the focus of the steps and the focus of recovery. And we get to do that a day at a time with like-minded people. And that's a blessing. Thanks a lot. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.